Hey there, my lovelies. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the Holy Shed 2022, which I should say for the next couple of weeks has relocated to South London. Not that anyone would necessarily realise that unless you're more discerning and see the different books behind me. Uh, I mean, it's even been said, apparently, that our area bishop, remember the area bishop, has been seen knocking around in these parts in South London. Oh, yes. Have mitre can travel. <laughs> well, have red breast. Anyway, who needs a mitre? I've often thought that. Although I suppose I've got kind of one of my own. <laughs> anyway, look, it's January. It's chilly and grey. Um, you know, the blinking pandemic is still hanging around and spring feels quite a long way off. Uh, but we're here, aren't we? We're here in the Holy Shed, right? where there's plenty of hope and good cheer to be had. Not that we're ignoring the struggles out there, or indeed our own struggles, all of which are real enough. But I think there is great comfort in knowing that we've got somewhere to belong, that we're not alone, that we're surrounded by others. And it makes me very happy whenever I hear, as I do quite a bit, uh, from people, from you, that... The Holy Shed has become a place of belonging for you. I mean, that is just music to my ears. So, you know, just settle down here and know that you're among friends. That said, we are mindful of those who do not have a home, uh, somewhere to belong, whether that is metaphorical or literal. And um, Terry and Jackie, who are regulars in this parish, though living in the West Midlands, uh, they sent me an amazing song just before Christmas, which I'd like to play to you. Uh, apparently, a homeless man in Wolverhampton named Mark Taylor wrote a poem about his plight as a homeless person uh, living in the city where Christmas was happening all around. And uh, Terry and Jackie decided rather wonderfully to put it to music. And um, it's, it's very powerful, so I'd like you to take a listen to it. Um, oh, and I've put it together with uh, that amazing icon of Dorothy Day and the homeless Holy Family that we've seen quite a bit of in the Holy Shed during the festive, festive season. It's a, an icon by Kelly Lattimore. Anyway, have a listen to this. I'm homeless in the city where the Christmas trees and lights look so pretty but to me they don't mean a thing for what I need Santa can bring Will I fall victim to the street My hands like ice can't feel my feet Never mind a cattle shed lowly My life is going no way slowly All around me festive cheer Yet all I feel is morbid fear The fear of where my life is going Thing I have no way of knowing I don't ask pity for my plight But the life I lead is one long fight And though that light is out of skelter Tonight I have the warmth of the shelter Thank God All around me Festive cheer Yet all I feel Is morbid fear A fear of where My life is going The thing I have No way of knowing In the city Where the Christmas trees and lights look so pretty 
Look at me, they don't mean a thing For what I need, Santa can bring Isn't that fantastic? Um, yeah, so very moving. Well done to, to Mark for writing those incredible words and, and well done to Terry and Jackie for, for putting music to them. Amazing. So look, let's light a candle, should we? If you've got one handy, then join me in lighting a candle and sending out some love to people like Mark and many others who literally or metaphorically are without a place to belong as we go forward into this new year. Um, also light it for anyone that you are feeling for right now. I'm also lighting this candle for Valerie, also of this parish, whose mum died recently, and so dealing with that sense of, of loss and bereavement, and for others of you, perhaps, who are feeling the loss of someone precious. Um, take a moment with this candle. And we say this prayer. God grant us the serenity of hopeful imagination as we step into the unknown of this new year. Courage to embrace whatever challenges the future will bring and enough love and determination to help make the world a fairer, kinder place for all to dwell in. Amen. Amen. So, as you know, Thursday just gone, 6th of January, was the Feast of Epiphany, the day in the church calendar when we focus on the visit of the Magi to the infant Jesus. And um, the story is absolutely one of my favourites in the whole of the Gospels, actually, not least because it presents such a, well, such a colourful, beautiful interfaith encounter you know, were Persian, probably Zoroastrian, stargazers, guided, not by scripture, by the way, but by their astrological wisdom journey to pay homage to a Jewish child. Uh, this is Arab people paying homage to a Jewish child uh, who will one day become the central figure in Christianity. And, um, and no one was converted or was expected to convert to anything else. Um, it's, a, it's a picture of synergy. So, hey, what's not to love? Uh, whether or not this story refers to an actual historical event doesn't matter a hoot to me. Um, I mean, there's no evidence that it does, but who cares? As we've said many times uh, before, there is what I've called day language, you know, the language of science and historical fact, and there's night language, the language of poetry, art, uh, imagination and sacred tradition. And both of these languages speak truth in their own way, but they do it in, in different ways. So yes, to me, the story of the Magi is profoundly truthful, you know, a sacred parable or fable. And in that sense, of course, it did happen and has happened many times since in all kinds of ways. Um, the story is Matthew's way of affirming to his Jewish audience that he's writing to 80 or 90 years after the birth of Jesus uh, that the significance of Christ and of his life reaches well beyond the borders of Judaism or indeed any other single tradition, uh, including Christianity. This is a universal event with universal significance. And the wonderful thing about such uh, a mysterious poetic story is the way that it fires the imagination, you know, of artists and poets and songwriters, as well as, you know, just ordinary folk like you and me. Possibly the greatest poem uh, about this story is T.S. Eliot's Journey of the Magi. And in Soul Space uh, this last week, I played 
um, the, the, what I think is the best ever reading of that poem by a guy called Dennis Adidi. So I'd like you to check this out too. cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels, galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted our summer palaces in the slopes and the terraces and the silken girls bringing sherbet. The camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and asking for their liquor and women. And the night fires going out and the lack of shelter and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly and the villagers dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred traveling all night, sleeping in snatches with voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then we came to a temperate valley, wet beneath the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a watermill beating in the darkness, and three trees on the low sky, and an old horse galloped away in the meadow. There we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking at empty wineskins. But there was no information, so we continued. And arriving at evening, not a moment too soon, finding that place, it was, you might say, satisfactory. All this happened a long time ago. I remember, and we'd do it again. Set down. This. Set down. This. Where we led all that way for birth or death. There was a birth, certainly. We have evidence and no doubt I had seen birth and death, but I thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us. Like death. Like our death. We returned to our places these kingdoms, but no longer at ease with the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching to their gods. I should be glad of another death. I should be glad of another death. Isn't that stunning? Just stunning, beautiful. And um, the main image uh, of the Magi that I used in Soul Space uh, on Thursday was this, or Wednesday it was, wasn't it? Was this. It's called The Epiphany by Janet McKenzie. And it's a wonderful picture where the artist portrays not men, but women 
wise ones of various ethnicities. It's an image, as you can see, of prayerful encounter. Um, and you know what? There were protests from conservative Christians when Catherine Jefford Shuri, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United States, a bit like the Archbishop of Canterbury in, uh, in the Anglican Church in America, used this image on her Christmas cards. I mean, really? Really? Why on earth is bland literalism so important to some people when dealing with, you know, the God who defies every single attempt at categorising or boxing in divinity? Janet McKenzie is an interesting person. I think she once described herself as agnostic. I don't know if that's true, but certainly her work is steeped in religious faith, um, especially Christianity, but, but more because uh, her overwhelming concern is to lift the figure of Jesus out of the white Christian ghetto to proclaim that divinity is everywhere in all people. And one of the great problems I think, is the way Jesus has persistently been portrayed uh, as an essentially white figure. I mean, we've all got used to this sort of image, haven't we, in movies and pictures. And even, you know, icons like this beautiful Byzantine icon basically portray uh, an essentially white Jesus, which, of course, he wasn't. And more importantly... I think if Jesus is perceived as an image of divinity, then I ask how does it feel for non-white people to see that divinity pictured in, you know, essentially white figures? Um, I mean, I can't properly answer that question as a white person, but this is how Jonathan Walton, who's minister at the Harvard Memorial Church, how he expresses the way that feels and why he is drawn so much to the art of Janet McKenzie. Actually, African-American and Latino community uh, uh, that was really under-resourced. It once had been a tall steeple Presbyterian church, and all of the icons, uh, the images of Jesus, both in the stained glass and on the walls, were all of you know, Michelangelo's cousin, or uh, <laughs> Jesus was looking like a Greek god. Um, and so I began searching for different images because it was really paining me to see these small African-American children come in each Sunday and look up at images of the divine and of the sacred to not be able to see themselves or their skin color pigmentation in any way in any representation of the divine. Um, I thought that that was so tragic. And so it was at that moment that I began searching for different images of Jesus. And I came across um, that wonderful painting of Janet McKenzie, Jesus of the People. At that moment, I just became captivated with Janet McKenzie and her work. Now, you know, I completely adore the art of Janet McKenzie and her most controversial work interestingly is this uh, which is called Jesus of the People in which she used a woman model to create an image of Jesus that transcends any culture gender or religious tradition um, as you'll see as well as using a female model who is of African background she incorporates a feather on the right-hand side of the picture, signifying Native American culture. And also on the left, by the head of, G of Jesus, uh, there's a symbol of yin-yang, which, which obviously represents Eastern cultures too. Um, it really is the most beautiful, gentle, strong image of Jesus uh, that I think you could find. And in the words of Sister Wendy Beckett, who you may know as well as being a nun is, is an art critic, she said this, she said, This is a haunting image of a peasant Jesus, dark, thick-lipped, looking out on us with ineffable dignity, with sadness but with confidence. Over his white robe he draws the darkness of our lack of love, holding it to himself, prepared to transform all sorrows if we will let him. So let's just hear from the artist herself 
uh, talking about um, a painting, this one, that prompted loads of hateful responses from, well, from good Christian people. Have a listen. I never had an interest or a calling to paint Jesus. But when a friend sent me an announcement about the National Catholic Reporters Jesus 2000 competition, it really got me to thinking about this. Could I? Would I? Should I? So I painted Jesus of the People, a dark interpretation of Christ mo modeled by a woman. I was revealed for the first time on the Today Show. It received worldwide enormous publicity and the response initially was absolutely horrific. People hated it, they were angry, they called me up, told me to read the Bible, hung up on me. I was uh, threatened in many ways. I was told if I painted Muhammad the same thing that happened to Salman Rushdie would happen to me. My mail was separated at this little local post office for fear of letter bombs. I can't help but feel protective of her when, when the reactions were so strong and negative uh, coming to her defense. Uh, however, though, on the, on the heels of that was uh, a, a tremendous amount of support. I've been shocked at the response to something that is, um, should be ordinary. We should expect to see all people celebrated and honored in sacred art always. So uh, that was also Janet's uh, son speaking in that video too. And what a lovely lady Janet McKenzie is. And, and paintings like hers, you know, convince me that God's spirit is uh, the character of God is often conveyed far more powerfully through art and images than through words alone. Words are important, you know, but um, I think that God is understood much more clearly through images than through things like doctrine and, and dogma and the likes, you know. And, you know, you will love Janet McKenzie's work, I promise you. Um, let me show you a, a few more pictures quite quickly that she's done. There's this one, which is called The Divine Journey, Companions of Love and Hope. And um, this, is, this, is a, this is a close up of it here. Um, I think this is just, you know, the most magnificent image here. Um, with Mary being there, this central figure holding her child in her arms. Um, there's something about the way that woman is looking at us, isn't there? That is strong and powerful, it's unmovable, um, and yet there's compassion in her stance or, or in her in her um, posture. And then she's surrounded by these uh, women as well. And um, I think that what this whole picture is conveying is is you know the sense of inclusion of of all people. I mean, the focus is obviously particularly on women, but, um, you know, it's, it's obviously far more than that. Um, yeah. It's an image which, which is fueled by memories of the past and created as a visual prayer for the present. And, um, uh, you know, Janet McKenzie says, it's my hope that this painting serves as a testament to the courage and strength of women into the future. Mary, the beloved foundational figure around which timeless women gather, reaches out to us through her gaze as her blessed child sleeps within her protection. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Um, and then there's this, there's this one. And, and it's interesting that she paints a lot of pictures of Mary and obviously, you know, sees in the image of Mary, um, a portrayal of, of the femininity in the divine. And uh, this is called Mother of the East. And uh, I love her work. I love the way that she, you know, 
portrays people from so many different kind of parts of the world and especially women to um, you know express the sense of the face of God being multicultural, multi-racial. Uh, um, yeah, it's just just lovely. And then you know here's a couple of pictures that again I like very much. The one on the left is clearly the Holy Family. And again, the sort of strength and dignity that is there. And um, and then the one on the right uh, is called Sanctuary, uh, which clearly is another image of Mary with the, the, the Christ child. Um, the Spirit is hovering over her, over them both. Uh, and there's just that sense of, of refuge and protection. Someone that, you know, in the best sense, you really wouldn't want to mess with. And then, you know, lastly, I would like to show you this one, which is called A Brave and Quiet Heart. And um, this is, you know, an explicitly LGBTQ painting that is commemorating the mass murder of 49 LGBT people at the Pulse uh, Gay Nightclub in Orlando in 2016. You might remember that. I remember, I remember it being in the news. I mean, it was huge, really, because, you know, 49 people murdered, 53 people left wounded. At that point in time, it was the biggest mass murder in, you know, American history. And about this picture, Janet McKenzie says, this painting presents one figure with outstretched arms in an invitational stance, allowing the heart to be vulnerable, open. Draped with an interpretation of the pride flag, this beloved symbol has become part of the body, large and inseparable from the figure. Here, the LGBTQ community is honoured for choosing courageous paths to peace and justice over hate time and again. I was inspired, she says, by Joseph's coat of many colours from the book of Genesis, who invariably chose the ethical journey which the community repeatedly does. This community. Behind this very still figure are doves, symbolising the inherent sanctity and sacredness of this being, something that sadly remains unknown and unseen by those who reject, do not accept, and are violent against the LGBTQ community. Another fantastic picture, isn't it? Now, the thing that I'd like to put to you as uh, we set out on another, another year is what sort of image of God do we have? Do you have? Um, how do you picture Jesus, the iconic figure at the heart of the Christian faith? I've always loved the title. I think I've mentioned it before in the shed of J.B. Phillips' little book, Your God is Too Small. It was written a long time ago, but it's still a very powerful little book. Your God is Too Small. Um, ultimately, you know, God's face is a picture. Um, has to be, because that's how we work. We humans obsessively picture whoever we are speaking to or listening to or thinking about. You, you know that thing of how you sometimes hear a voice on the radio, someone that you become very familiar with as a voice, and you have a picture in your mind of what that person is like. And sometimes when you actually see them, then they're, they're, they're not like it at all. Um, but but all, that is testament to the fact that we have this um, you know, obsession, this need to picture people that we're speaking to or listening to or, or things that we're thinking about. And we can't think about Jesus without some picture in our mind. And and that's OK, because, um, you know, that's that's, as I say, how we work. But the question is who or what or in what way do we picture Jesus or picture God? There's no problem with that picture reflecting our own culture and background. That's natural in itself provided uh, we don't ever believe for even a second that this is a true picture or that it's the whole picture. You know, God is always greater. Um, that's, that's the real truth. God is always greater uh, than, you know, any 
insight or understanding or picture that we have. But that shouldn't stop us from picturing, but it should drive us on to picture God in ever more diverse ways. And that's something that people like Janet McKenzie teach us to do, and I'm personally very grateful for that. So let's, let's, uh, let's have a prayer, should we, together? That um, I wrote earlier. along with this beautiful image of Jesus of the people. Multicoloured God, all races and cultures reflect your image. In your likeness, rainbow communities smile and swell with heavenly pride, radiating your joy and freedom. All creation revels in God's kaleidoscopic glory, dancing on the grave of bland uniformity. Oh, may your bountiful heart flood and overwhelm our world of fear and anxiety, that we may discover your presence in every face, however different from our own, in every shape, size and colour of your variegated world filled with splendour. May the song of all creation fill our very souls, ringing out the good news, God is all and in all. Amen. Okay, well, you know, I think this all leads us to the point of needing to make a toast, right? And I just happen to have something with me with which to do that. So um, if you've got a drink, I invite you to pour it or get it to hand right now and um, hold it in your hand with me as we make a toast. A toast to the divine face revealed in everything in every one, however much it may be obscured in some people. Uh, I think that if we can look long enough and hard enough, we can find the face of God in every person, everywhere. Um, it's a toast to January. <laughs> January, my favourite month. Uh, a toast to crisp blue skies and brilliant winter sunshine, which we have had in London today, uh, but maybe not tomorrow. So also a toast to chilly days and grey skies, because you know what? They're part of our life in January too. And it's no good just switching off to them. We need to open ourselves up and live as fully and generously as we can each moment, whatever the sky is doing. Uh, it's a toast to, well, toast to toast, huh? Toast and butter, hmm. mugs of tea uh, or a wee glass of something else. Uh, a toast to all those things that bring us comfort in these dark and chilly days. A toast to thoughts and images and hopes that transcend all the Covid crap and enable us to just see a little bit above it all. It's one of the things I always think, you know, is that um, the sun's always shining. It's just that sometimes clouds get in the way. And if we could just get above those clouds, as we do when we fly off and on a plane or something, then you suddenly realise... Actually, the sun's shining all the time. And that's a pretty good thought to hold on to. And I think in the midst of these dark and difficult days of COVID and Omicron and, you know, Omicron and all that stuff, <laughs> it's good to let our hearts transcend all of that and just catch a vision of something greater. So here's a toast to life, Lahaim. Fantastic. Well... If uh, you're still enjoying the shed, if you like what we're doing here, then you can support us by buying us a coffee or two. The link is on your screen here, or you can find it at the top of the post on the Holy Shed Facebook page. And thanks uh, once again so much to those of you who uh, contribute to our support, not just in this way with uh, buying us coffees, but you know through words of encouragement, through prayers that hopefully you send up for us to whatever we appreciate all of that so much i've mentioned this evening uh, a bit about soul space the one that we had last week and that is now available as a recording so if you weren't able to be there you can see it and there is a link uh, on the facebook page that you can find for that tomorrow morning it is my last in a little run of doing pause for thoughts sharing my four penneth on the radio to millions of people which is a great privilege so uh it's around about 9 20 on bbc radio 2 
and Zoe Ball is back from her holiday, so I'll be with her. So uh, join me if you can. Here's a blessing. The blessing of God, the eternal goodwill of God, the shalom and salam of God, the wildness and warmth of God, be among us and between us now and always. And a great, big, huge blessing from God, the creator, the liberator and the sustainer be upon us each and every one of you so there we are we're just about done and um, I'm going to finish with a lovely little piece of music that I used at the beginning of Soul Space on Wednesday which is just a nice musical version of, of We Three Kings such a beautiful tune that isn't it it's, it kind of is a tune that embodies the kind of uh, mystical you know um, beauty of the story of the Magi and I've put it together with the uh, image that uh, we've been looking at tonight of uh, the Epiphany by Janet McKenzie. So there it is, guys. Have a good week. And um, I'll be seeing you again next Sunday if you can join me or whenever you listen in. And uh, in the meantime, be very kind to yourselves in these challenging times. Be kind to other people round about who... Uh, going through the same crap and maybe more um, in all of this you know darkness and difficulty of these hopefully closing days of Covid as we've known it stay human Amen see you soon <laughs>